I need your help by putting your hands together and celebrating all of our campuses joining us this Christmas season. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Let's go. It's Christmas. And, uh, and we, got, uh, we got the helicopter uh, ready to roll, and as he came over, the magneto went out. I don't know what that is, but I'm not flying without it. I can tell you that right now. And uh, we are in a series entitled Socks and Underwear. If you are joining us for the first time, it's week three. You can jump in and get in the Christmassy spirit and watch the previous two messages. We're going to continue in this. And I just want to say, I love Christmas. I love the season. I love the food. I love the family. I love Christmas lights. I don't like purchasing stuff, but I like going shopping. Who's with me on that? Raise your hand. You know what I mean? I like the vibe, and I like seeing people just swipe their cards and me not swipe mine. I like that. That's a good feeling. Um, I know last week that there were a few families that purchased their entire Christmas on Amazon during the message, trying to make it look like they were giving online. That was tricky, and I'm proud of you, very proud of you. I, I know that so many things about Christmas is so much. I love Christmas trees. I know people try to get into all the Saturnalia and pagan this and pagan that. If we knew all the traditions we are involved in that came from pagan origin, we couldn't breathe. I can just tell you right now. But the whole deal is about Jesus. The whole deal is about his birth. The whole deal is about salvation. And that we get to celebrate at this level, uh, with this intensity, with this much, really this much fun. It is absolutely fun. I love eggnog. I love wreaths. I love all of it. I even have a Christmas train that actually is about midway through my 12-foot Christmas tree that goes around my Christmas tree. I mean, I love it. I just, I'm, I'm weird, but I... I think a lot of us dig it. You know what else I love? I love laying in bed at night thinking about what it was like when the maker of the universe came to earth. Matter of fact, I just jotted a few thoughts down. Like what it was like the first time Mary touched the face of God. Now, I know automatically we want to transition our mental understanding that she didn't know that it was God. She did. She was told. And not only was she told that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the angel also told her what to name him. And to think that moment that she touched the face of God, I also thought, I mean, what was it like to be a baby that overlooked the universe, left the robes of eternity, and put on the rags of humanity. I, I can't even fathom it. I can't fathom what it was like. Of course, the angels came declaring the good news of Jesus to the shepherds. But what was it like when the angels were looking over the porch rail of heaven watching Mary change Jesus' first diaper? I mean, these thoughts... Maybe I shouldn't be thinking these things, but these are the kind of thoughts I think to myself that, that in this moment, in the span of infinitum and eternity, that God, Jesus, understood this, and so did, if you will, the universe understood it. And that all of heaven's going, oh, man, wow. Or, or, or sitting there watching him just as excited as you are when your child took their first steps, all of the universe, all of heaven, watching Jesus go, oh, here he goes. Oh, oh, that's amazing. That's knowing that he made humanity yet was humanity. And he did all this for you and for me. I, I can't imagine what the scholars and the teachers and the preachers at the synagogue thought, knowing that later on that was Jesus listening to them preach. And I realize he's listening today as well. This Christmas basic for me is taking the reality of the supernatural into our day-to-day life. It's allowing Christmas not to be some sensational, 
um, miss from God's best, but taking the basics and putting them into our everyday thought process. And that's exactly what this passage does in Luke chapter 2. And I want to read from verses 4 through 7. And I want us to look at the power of this part of the basic. I would say this, and, and I can't put like uh, necessarily a singular moment of greatest significance. Obviously, the birth of Jesus is going to be that moment. But within that moment, I think for you and I, something for at least right now, something for right now in, in that 21st century moment, I believe that this portion of the Christmas story could possibly be the most important or the most um, potentially noted or needed to be noted section of the Christmas story. And, and I want to break it down for you. Again, we're in the Christmas basics. We're, we're diving in uh, to some pretty heavy stuff. It, it seems a little educational uh, instead of devotional. But if you're with me at all campuses, give me a rowdy yeah. Okay, so let's dive in. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. I'm going to hit pause. Let me tell you why this is important. All of these towns are prophetically noted. These things are not just put in here by happenstance. And not only that, they're continued to be scribed and noted throughout the Scripture, not by happenstance. It's like we read this thing, Galilee and Nazareth, like this. No, these are prophetic words. These are things that are being echoed at some points within uh, uh, as far back as 4,000 years prior. So when you read this stuff, I want you and I want us as a church and as Christ followers to gather the importance, the significance of even these, what we might consider minor details. And then it goes on, the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, again, prophetic, which is called Bethlehem. Because why? Here's what it says. They're giving you the promises. They're putting, if you will, the DNA test of the messianic promise of who Jesus is. This is this DNA test. Is this really the Messiah? Well, all of these pieces of the puzzle they just mentioned have to be inclusive so that you can know who Jesus was and who Jesus is. It says that he was from the house, and not just the house, but the line or the family tree, the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, period. Now let's pause for just a second. Why is this so important? Why is the fact that the line of David is so important? Because it had the Messiah, Jesus, had to come from this family because of the promise that was found all the way back 4,000 years prior in the book of Genesis. And also noted with great clarity throughout many of the major prophets telling the story. I want to read one specific place in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 12. It says, when your days are over and you rest and with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I'll establish his, God's, the Messiah's kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And in the Old Testament, um, when you're looking at the original Hebrew, the name, the word name there is capitalized. A, a, again, indicating deity. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and ever, speaking specifically to the house and the line of David. This all the way back thousands and thousands of years ago. And I know what you're saying right now. This doesn't give me the heebie-jeebies like the Polar Express. I, I know that, which is the best Christmas movie ever. You, you look at, here's the thing. This isn't the purpose. The purpose is this. I want a solid foundation to why I'm even sitting here today. I want a solid foundation of why I need to stand up and live according to what the Word of God says. Why? Because the proven existence of Jesus, not only the existence of Jesus, is also proven in the lineage of who he was from. And not only was Mary from the line of David, also Joseph. You know who else was from the line of David? Because I know you're like, well, he's from a kingship. He said, he, he was from commoners. I mean, my wife, 
shared a story last year that was so powerful. I, I mean, I think it's important just to reiterate just a few people that were also in the family tree. I don't want you to raise your hand because I know some people might have their family with them this weekend, but all of us have that family member or two. You're like, man, when they meet this one, <laughs> wow. You know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> wow. Well, Jesus had people like that in his family lineage too, like Tamar. Like Tamar, who slept with her father-in-law and became a baby daddy. And then you go on and you look at, for instance, Ruth, who was her whole family were devil worshipers. And then you walk down the story a little bit more, and you see Rahab, whose profession was prostitution. She was a hooker. And then you go on, you see somebody that many of you know the name of, Bathsheba, who was an adulterer. And all of these people were in the family of Jesus. What I'm trying to tell you is this. These people... God loved and used and in, in a huge way, and even though their story and their past wasn't perfect, their life wasn't perfect, listen, Jesus can use you too. Jesus can use your family as well. I want to give you a couple of basics that are so important to this story. Number one, as I've already mentioned, Jesus is the line of David. That's so important. You get this. That's so um, significant because if it's not there, it doesn't matter. It won't equal up. That's again why you can boldly say what no other religion can say is the historic precedent and the historic evidence that Jesus was the Messiah thousands of years before. But also I believe there's a basic in this text that is relevant, potentially the most specific relevant piece of the Christmas story in our time. And let's read on in verse number 6 and 7 of Luke chapter 2. It says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes, which is simply just, there was just um, cloth and different things they found from newborn calves uh, there within uh, the cave itself, what we would consider a barn. It wasn't a barn. It was just some type of, uh, structure within the earth that they created, pro probably, most likely, a cave-like structure. And then it says, and laid him in a feed trough. That's what the word manger means. I mean, take whatever feed trough you use. Matter of fact, I was feeding my dog Arlo this morning, and I thought to myself, if he was a little larger and had a little feed, a little bit bigger, that's basically what Jesus was laid in, a dirty bowl. And uh, we make it all sweet and, and sanctimonious, but the reality is he was laid in a feed trough. Yes, the king of the universe, the one who created you, who bled and died. And people ask all the time, why? Why didn't he come it's just, and just come rain down fire and just show up? The reason is, is because he came to reach you and me. And he became like us so that we could reign with him. Such a powerful truth. It goes on to say, to laid him in a manger because there was, and you know this part of the story, there was no room for him in the inn. How many of you are like me, and you don't have to raise your hand to this, but just how many of you just hope the inn ma innkeeper made it to heaven? I mean, I kind of hope that. I'm like, I hope he made it because if nothing else, I want to see and, and I know he had no idea that Jesus was the Messiah. I understand that. I mean, I have a pretty good certainty of that. But I just want to get to heaven and go, dude, did you know later? Did, do you remember that night? Did you see them? Did you see that situation that transpired? Did you have any idea? Because for me, naturally, I automatically think the innkeeper is sitting there at, you know, whatever it was, the Bethlehem in or whatever it was that he's sitting there he's like hey we're out and of course it was a crowded time uh, the Super Bowl was in town their Super Bowl which is the census and they were taking all of the uh, the census of the local region there's no space and I automatically kind of like man that innkeeper was rude like it was one of those deals like get away uh, I can't believe you're in here and, and I kind of automatically feel like you know what I, I, I could one up on that because I think I might have known Anna knew Simeon knew 
I mean, they were in touch with God enough to know that at eight days old, that was the chi- that was the Messiah, that was the Christ. The innkeeper just kind of like, ah, I'm full, I've made my money, this, that, the other. And it's easy to kind for me, I'm, I'm putting this on me, to kind of have a bent that, man, this guy really was shallow. He missed out. But really, here's what I think God's saying, is that today you get to choose vacancy for Jesus in your Christmas story. And I know what many of us automatically say, because I'm an auto, my mind automatically, well, man, I'm saved. I know Christ. I love, but let me ask you some more specific questions. Did you give Jesus room this morning with prayer and quiet time as he calls us to in Psalms chapter 1, 1 through 4? Was there room? Or was the end full? You know, I had to get ready. I had to check Instagram. I had to wrap that last gift. I had to go to church. We had to hurry. There's just no room. There's just no time. You know, we had to, and plus I've got this new foundation, it just takes so long to get on. I mean, it just, it's, I did not even know if it matched. And, and I hope you laugh, otherwise we're all going to be crying in here. Because the crazy thing is this. Many of us, it's Christmas, and he doesn't have any place. He has no space. Does he have room, obviously, in your heart? Let me ask you this. Does he have room in your marriage? Does your spouse know Jesus is here? Is Jesus priority? Now, I don't know about you. When I check into a hotel and I'm, and I'm doing my thing, I feel like the king. I feel like I'm the only one that's ever been in that room. Has anybody ever been that way before? I'm not talking about you germaphobes that are all in there in latex gloves and sleeping in a full robe. I, I'm talking about, I'm like, I'm the, this is my kingdom. <laughs> oh, yeah, turn that TV on. I don't even know how to turn it on. Nine, there's like 14 on buttons on it. Either way, you're just like, yes. And you're like, bring me some towels. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want this cheap coffee. I want nicer coffee. I have bottled water, please. Oh, you're in a room serve. You know what I'm saying? You're just like, man, I am the man. And I want to be the centerpiece of this room. What's crazy is this. Jesus wants to make certain that you understand he wants to be the central figure in your room. And your spouse doesn't even see that you are leading in that direction. I mean, when's the last time together, don't answer out loud, don't raise your hand, don't elbow, don't hit anybody in the ribs. I'm just saying, when's the last time you've even prayed? Well, my spouse doesn't pray. Why don't you pray? Won't you straight up just say, Jesus, Merry Christmas, in Jesus' name, amen. And I promise you, your spouse, the first time I go, weirdo. Second time, they're going to be like, amen. Third time, I'm like, I like this. And I promise you, it inspires the atmosphere. Well, I don't have to pray with my spouse to love Jesus. Where do we come up with the, how do you become a theologian so fast to diss God? (laughs) It's amazing. The most theological people I ever meet are the ones that don't do jack for God. It is amazing to me. Don't have to go to church, don't have to pray, don't have to read the Bible, don't have to walk an aisle, don't have to pray a prayer, don't have to be baptized, don't have to, it's amazing. How do you know all this? I'm just saying, if Jesus has room, it's, he has room in your marriage. What about your family relationships? What about praying with your kids, mom, dad? Do you pray with your kids? What about this, sitting down at your meal where Jesus not only asked us to pray, he, he exemplified this prayer. Not only at the Lord's table, he exemplified it in salvation. He says that if you come, knock on the door, come in, be my guest. He says, if you ask, I'll open up. And then here's what Jesus says, I'll have supper with you if you pray and ask. He's asking you to pray. Why don't you pray for your meal? Can Jesus even show up at your meal with your homies sitting there at Taco Bell? Or are you embarrassed? Well, I don't have to pray for my meal, but people know. Why don't you? Jesus said he took his bread and did what? He broke it and gave thanks. 
I'm just saying, does Jesus have room? Or are you straight up, no vacancy? I mean, do your kids see you giving room to Jesus in your home? It's that simple. What about your conversations with your kids? Not just your prayer time, what about your conversations? I, I love the video that we watched prior to this message. I absolutely love it. And kids, you know, in Santa Claus and all the thoughts and this, that, or the other. And I'm, I'm not anti-Santa and I, I'm not this, that, or the other. But I love being challenged, even, even my own kids, even my own kids at their age now. I love hearing the facts of what they know. But I'm also challenged by what they don't know. Are we having conversations that lead our kids to knowledge? Someone asked the other day, they were like, well, man, we just live in a society where the kids just aren't taught anymore, and then they went off on the fact that there's just not Sunday school. If they had Sunday school, they'd learn this stuff. I said, your home is Sunday school. You are the Sunday school, Mom. Why are you letting someone else do the maximum work in your kid's life? Well, I don't know that much. Well, if you would go to school, if you will, in your quiet time, you'll be able to school your kids about the things of Jesus. You see what I'm saying? There's no room in the inn. There's no room. I want to give you another example just to continue this detriment to many of us at this moment. What about on the gram? What about on Facebook? I mean, you'll sell anything on there. You'll high-five anything on there if the filter's right. You'll do what? Are you willing to high-five what Jesus has done in your life? What about your checking account? Mm, no room. No room. I'm going to get a gift for everybody else, but, you know, he asked for 10%, and I'm not, I just, you know... Let me give you another example. What about at your work? Is there any room at the end? Do your coworkers even know you love Christ? Now, I didn't say love God, because we everybody loves God. I mean, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I love God. I mean, even the weirdest, weird, 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 satanic, this, that, or the others, they'll transition it to their understanding of their deity. I mean, but most people say, but do you love Christ? Does it, does it show at your workplace? Are you passionate about Jesus? Oh, man, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that not only has room, is willing to make more room. I'm like, we got to inflate a mattress. We're, we're in. Now, I got a cot too. I got a day bed. I've got a trundle. I've got, you know what I mean? Let's just get more. You know, I want as much space as I can possibly get in Jesus' name. I want room. I want him to have room in every area of my life. I want, what about your tongue? What about your mouth? It's easy to jump on the innkeeper. But you and I have got to make sure that we make room for him at our school, on our ball team. And it goes on and on and on. This Christmas, I want to tell you how you can make room so that you can make room and make sure that the gift that you're giving Christ this Christmas is massively significant. I think there's three things you can do. You can recognize these three things. Number one is this, celebration. We all love, I love to party at Christmas. I love it, I love it. I mean, we started December 1st with 62 people in our home. Many of you were there. I absolutely love it. I mean, we partied last night. We're partying tonight after we party as a church, worshiping Jesus and celebrating and partying. I and mean, we're going to party again. And then I'm going to party on Monday. And then I'm going to party on Tuesday. And then after I have the Lord's Supper on Tuesday, then I'm going to Waffle House and party in there in Jesus' name. It's a Christmas Eve God-given tradition. And then after that, I'm going to party at the movie theater. And then I'm going to party that morning. And then I'm going to drive my parents and party again. I love celebrating. Do you celebrate what Jesus has done for you? Are you making room for the celebration? Here's what you celebrate. Number one, God loves you. Number two, God is with you. Number three, God's for you. That's enough to celebrate. And if you love celebrating, put your hands together and practice right now. I love it. I love Jesus. Merry Christmas, Jesus. I love the word Merry Christmas as much for the word Merry. I just love that word. I'm Mary. 
I'm merry. I like the word gay, too. I know it has weird connotations, potentially, but I like it. I like what it word. I'm gay and merry. And, and that is really wild in 2019. But say it anyway. I love celebrating, being happy, and having joy. Amen? Let's get excited about what Jesus has done. The shepherds celebrated where they were in faith, left their livestock. They got up and left. The shepherds celebrated where they were. You need to celebrate where you are. Jesus isn't always going to call you to celebrate when you're sitting in the service. It's going to be at work. It's going to be wherever. Celebrate that moment. High five what Jesus has done. I thank Jesus for what he's done. I mean, those who missed the majesty of God, of Christ's arrival, missed it not because probably of acts of evil and, and malice and wicked, wicked sins. They missed it. Because they just weren't looking. And you're going to miss an opportunity to celebrate if you're just not looking. Put yourself in a position to celebrate the goodness of God. Whether you're breathing deep right now, thank you, Jesus. If you're able to buy a few gifts for your family, celebrate the fact that who provided those for you? Jesus did. Jesus. You get to celebrate the relationships you're in. You get to celebrate. It's so easy to spend the majority of the time discussing a situation and talking about the negatives instead of celebrating the wins. Again, they didn't miss Jesus because they were living and and celebrating and worshiping the devil. They did it because, I believe, because they just weren't looking. Not only celebration, but if you want to focus in and make sure there's plenty of room, you need to make sure you understand and thank God for your salvation. If you are grateful to God that you have been saved... Would you just slip your hand up at all of our campuses? I mean, if you're grateful, aren't you grateful? I mean, and it's more than hell insurance. It's more than just not going to hell. It's the fact that you're going to get to spend eternity in heaven and that the joy of God is right now, is right now. And I love celebrating the fact that I'm saved. And there is times in doing so when it weirds people out, when it messes people up. I mean, first of all, you have to understand you were saved by something. You know what you were saved by? You were saved by faith in Jesus Christ because he came. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. The baby in the manger saved you. You were saved by Christ, not by yourself, not by works, nothing you can do. Matter of fact, if you ever go to rescue a class, lifeguarding, anything, the first thing they teach you is you cannot rescue someone who is still trying to rescue themselves. And I'm about to preach right now. And here's what happens. As many of you think you can save yourself and you're still floundering out there, I got this, I can do this. Until you give up and let Jesus take control, you will never truly understand salvation and ever been rescued. The reason many are excited about being rescued is because you saved yourself. You did it your way. You did not stop flipping and floundering and let Jesus take, listen, control. He didn't come to be some prince. He came to be your king. And though he came lowly in his majesty, now he wants to be Lord. And until you stop flipping and floundering around, oh, I kind of do it my way, you can't be saved your way. You can't be saved in your time. You can't be saved how you want. You're saved by Jesus through faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. And only that, if you want to make room for him, you celebrate that. If you've been rescued, you can't wait to celebrate it. You cannot wait. I've watched a rescue two times in my life, two times. And and a third time this last summer, uh, I rescued that didn't rescue. I mean, watched him for, I don't know, 25 minutes trying to bring this guy back to life. He died, I mean, literally I don't know, Sarah, how far from us? Ten yards? And I was speaking in Florida, in St. Petersburg, and they uh, had an afternoon in Clearwater. I'll never forget this. I'm sitting on the beach in Clearwater, Florida, and I I could hear somebody kind of out there, you know, I I guess you could use the word yelling, floundering around. And then it, it was somewhat early. It was probably like 10 in the morning. There wasn't a ton of people on the beach. And you could hear, and then the, it, it kind of stopped. And then back behind me in, in those condos, people were all kind of like peering over the edge. 
of the rails, you know, drinking their coffee and their robes, just sitting up there, you know how it is. And then all of a sudden, I look back, and a guy from the second story of this condo jumped into that grassy dune area right below and took off 100 mile an hour. And then he just started swimming. From his vantage point, he could see that someone was just floating out there. He swims all the way out there. He throws the guy on his shoulders, swims all the way back in, flips him over, resuscitates him. A few people gather around at this time, resuscitate him, and he lives. And I look back. I mean, there's probably 10 condos, all of them five, six stories tall, hundreds of people looking. And I look back, and I was like, that's the church. They just all stand and watch him. But I guarantee you the guy that was on the second floor had been rescued. And he knew about what rescue was about. And he knew what it took to rescue someone. And the reason you're still standing on your condo is because you've never made room for true salvation to truly been rescued. Because if you've been rescued for something, you can't wait to tell somebody you've been rescued. That's what Christmas is all about. It's what it's all about. Is telling someone you've been saved, make room in the conversation. Tell somebody. Why? Because I, I don't guarantee you, but there's a great chance they need to be rescued. They need to be rescued. I put a picture on Instagram the other night. Or actually, it was Facebook. Uh, Friday night. And it was a picture of me and my hot wife, my girlfriend. And she looked like she was... It was like our wedding day. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm old. I was like, I'm her dad. Hey, this is my girl. I mean, it was just she looked amazing. She looked amazing. And, and, and I got a text from a gentleman by the name of, of Brandon. He goes, I don't mean to look like a stalker, but I'm so inspired by your marriage. I was just looking at your picture on Facebook, and I just want to tell you thank you for the exam. What? There's somebody waiting to be inspired at all times. Do something that's going to make room for Jesus in every situation, especially salvation. Especially salvation, because you've been saved from sin. Amen? You've been saved from sin. Amen? You've been saved from shame. Amen? You've been saved from yourself. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to celebrate salvation. And lastly, I'm going to celebrate this, reconciliation. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's what they said. At Christmas, I want to celebrate, I want to have celebration, I want to understand salvation, and I want to make sure that reconciliation is taking place, not only for people who need Christ and that rescue moment, not only people for that moment, but also for people in my relationships that this Christmas I know I'm going to have to confront, I'm going to have to address. Are you living in peace with that person? Peace on earth. If you want to distance someone from understanding who God is, if you want someone to live in hatred towards someone, I, I encourage you to make peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the testimony of your life because it was the testimony of what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. Peace with God, peace with others. Because it's so beautiful. Here's what I want you to know, the difference between resolution and reconciliation. Resolution focuses on solving the problem, and that's what many of us do. But reconciliation focuses on solving the relationship. You, you focus on the problem or you focus, and there's nothing wrong with solving the problem, but you need to make sure that your goal is not just solving the problem, but it's also solving and re rekindling and making right the relationship. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just encourage you right now, have you made room? Have you made room? I, I would be amiss not to ask this question. It, it, there are people in the sound of my voice, I'm certain right now, that are not even sure if they were to die right now, they'd go to heaven. They, they've been flipping and, and, and floundering and, and trying to keep their head above water and never made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. If that's you and you're not 100% sure if you're saved right now with no one looking around, would you just slip your hand up right now and say, I want to make sure that I've made room in my heart. You can put it right back down. Just slip your hand up right now. You're like, I want to make sure that this Christmas, awesome. You can put them right back down. I love that. Would you just pray this prayer? 
I want you to know, again, the prayer does not save you. You're like, you say that every week, and it's because it's true. It doesn't save you the intent of your heart to stop kicking, to stop trying to swim and say, Jesus, I want you to be my boss. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I repent. I'm turning away. I want to live for you. I want to live for you. Come into my life. I make room for you. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. In Jesus' name. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer in a minute, would you just slip your hand up at all campuses? I love that. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You can, I want to encourage you to do one or two things. Number one, you can get up out of your seat. There's listen and lead team members that would love to pray with you and encourage you and talk to you about the next step. Or secondly, would you just take time to take one of those Connect cards here in a moment? And would you just fill that out and say, I prayed that prayer. I'm certain Jesus came in my life. I received the greatest gift this Christmas, Jesus. Just take that Connect card. You can grab one right now while no one's looking. Just grab one. And I love the fact that Jesus is saving lives. Father, thank you for this moment of transformation. Let us this Christmas make room for celebration, celebrating our salvation and being certain that reconciliation is taking place with you and with the people that we love and the people in our sphere, in our world. We thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you put your hands together for the many who said yes to Jesus right now? I love that. I love it. I love it. Can I uh, encourage you as our host assist us with this next moment at all of our campuses? This is your opportunity to give. This is your opportunity to give. And giving is obedience. And if you're a regular attender and member of Brand New Church, this is your time to bring it, to bring your best. This is um, a fun time of year. I love seeing what's uh, in everybody's uh, gifts that I supposedly bought, that my wife bought. But still, I, I, I love seeing it. But I do know this. I, I don't know about you. How many of you got socks already or know you're getting socks this Christmas? Yes. How many of you asked for socks? Just be straight up honest before God. Yes, I know. It's that important, isn't it? I'm wearing, again, the same ones I stole from the bag last week. They're still not wrapped. I stole them again. I absolutely love it. They're not these, but uh, these are probably cool again. I have no idea. Uh, but I, I love the fact that you have the opportunity to give. We have the opportunity to give because God first gave. And my exhortation to you is that if you want to learn the joy of giving, give for changed lives. It's fun as my kids um, mature and get older, watching them have the joy of giving gifts. I love that. I absolutely love it. I mean, just sitting back and watching all of them mooch off my Amazon Prime is just such a joy. I absolutely love it. It's just fun to see all the gifts and all the stuff coming through. And uh, I just want to encourage you, give your best. Give your best. The basic is the tithe. That's the basic. And then you have the opportunity to give over and above, which so many of you did, and changed kids' Christmas with new bikes and, and changed people's opportunity to see God's best with food. And, and I know that uh, our other Mercy Malls are so successful as well. By the way, in case you don't know, we, we have a Mercy Mall in Midlothian, Virginia that has two locations. And they were open all week this week and, and met the needs, listen to this, of over seven hundred families in Midlothian, Virginia. Is that amazing? They're open all week. And I love the fact that our Farmington campus, our, our Quitman, Texas Mercy Mall, which is so powerful, but our Farmington campus this week, 2,340 pounds of food meeting needs this week because you gave. And I want to celebrate that through applause as well. And volunteers help make it happen. It's such, a, it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. I encourage you to give. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and before we continue in worship, let's pray and ask God to be honored. Father, we, we pray in this moment that it would be um, giving our best to you. We pray you'd be glorified. We pray that our, um, our hearts, our lives, our conversation, our relationships would make room for you. 
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.